I invite you to open your Bible this morning to Psalm 33. We're going to look at one verse. And I'm sure that you've, you have caught that uh, this service today is in tribute to our anniversary as a nation. And I want to remind you about some things that are so important uh, that we need as Christians uh, to appreciate in terms of what God is doing and what God has done in this great country who now on the, the Tuesday, July the 4th, will be uh, 247 years. It's amazing when you read accurate history of America, you can't but help see the hand of God as he has blessed and helped us to do great and mighty things as, this, as a, a country. The blessings of God has been placed upon this country and we see that in history, we see the blessings that he has bestowed upon this great land that God has given to us. Now I wanna emphasize that for this very reason. There are historians that are seeking to write out God in anything to do with our history. And my friend, that's quite frankly wrong because a lot of what this great country has achieved in its 247 years has been a byproduct of God's rich blessings upon us. If you were to remove the hand of God from the United States of America, uh, we would be in deep trouble. Now, I say that but I add to this, despite the blessings of God on this country, America seems to be moving away from God at an enormous speed for some reason. And if God's people do not stand up and are counted for God, we are in great trouble. Well, this is what the scripture says, Psalm 33:12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Now look at that scripture. Blessings. God's going to bless a country, this country, this nation, whose God is the Lord. Now, not just any God. He specifies the God is the Lord. He is directly, divinely speaking of the true and the living God that you and I worship who was personified in the person of Jesus Christ, who came to this earth, God in the flesh, who lived among us, who lived some 30, maybe 33 years on this earth, and then laid down his life that we could pick up our life and have life abundant and life eternal. And so it's important that on this 247th birthday of the United States of America, that we, re, we be reminded what the scripture says, God blesses the nation whose God is the Lord. Well, be, the beginning of this country, it was rooted in Christianity. Now, some of you are probably sitting there saying, well, duh, of course it was. Well, if you read history, if you read the history that's being written today that is taught in our schools, and believed by many people, God was not a part uh, of any of that, nor was anything to do with uh, Christianity. And the truth of the matter is, it's just the opposite. That everything that this country has been able to achieve, it has been because of the hand of God and His blessings upon us. 1620, 102 pilgrims arrived on the East Coast. They came in a boat that was 25 feet wide and 100 feet long. They arrived on a bitterly cold day in November. And they immediately gathered together once they disembarked from the boat. And they made a covenant. It's called the Mayflower Compact. And this is one phrase of that compact. They say, we came for the glory of God and the advancement of the Christian faith. Now that statement is not, or should not be controversial, nor should it be something that we have to interpret 
They came for the advancement of the Christian faith. They were leaving a country that uh, controlled the church and controlled what people were to believe and belong to. And they came to be free, to have the freedom of worship, which you and I enjoy every week and every day as far as that goes. And so it all had to do with the advancement of Christianity. Our founding fathers believed in God and they set out from their country to come, uh, to come here. And at great sacrifice, did you know, the food supply for the first year was five, five grains of corn each person got each day, just five. And so the first year of the 102 people, 45 died, leaving 58. But in the fall of 1621, they harvested 21 acres of corn and they gathered everyone together and they marched through the cornfields and they sang like what, what we did today. They were singing. What were they singing? They sang Psalm 24.1. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Sure sounds like they believed in God. They were seeking to follow and give God the glory and God the honor for the harvest. Now they had food that they could eat, uh, more than just five grains of corn. And then the following month, the 58 uh, pilgrims met with 80 Indians. And for three days, they did not do anything except eat, See, Baptists were way back in those days. I want you to see that. They ate, they prayed, they sang, and they preached. That's all they did. Because they believed in God, that God brought them to this country, and they were praising Him and thanking Him for all the blessings. Well, I want to, for us to think about, for just a few moments uh, this morning, some questions about the greatness of America. Is America a great nation? The first, the first um, a question I want us to consider is what, what makes America great? Well, America is a beautiful country. If you've been up to the mountains recently as I have, uh, those beautiful mountains, and then you consider uh, the west um, uh, coast and uh, the beauty of that uh, land, and as you think about uh, the uh, bluegrass uh, state of uh, Kentucky, and as you look down to, to Florida, the clear uh, water that uh, we have and the beaches that we have, we are a beautiful nation. So many wonderful, extravagant places that you can go and travel. But that's not what makes America great. We're blessed with a beautiful country. But America is not great just because America is beautiful. Some of you will know that uh, some years ago there was a man that came to America and uh, he began to uh, look at uh, what made America great. And how was a small band of people able to win a war that was against the greatest military in the history of the world at that particular time? A small group of people who were committed to founding a nation under God, how were they able to succeed in the battles that they faced? Well, America is a great nation because America is good. There was a, a French political uh, philosopher by the name of Alex uh, de Tocqueville. He came to America seeking to find out the answers to this nation. And he traveled all across the nation. He looked at our rivers and our farms. He looked at our military. He looked at every area of this country in seeking to determine what has made America great. When he went back to France, this is what he wrote. He wrote that, uh, that uh, America is great because they're good. If they ever cease to be good, they will fail. Well, what's the goodness that he was talking about? 
It wasn't until he went into the churches that he was able to realize what was the thing that made this country so great. And it was great because of those who have, they were good people who were good because they experienced the righteousness of God in their life. And as he listened to the preachers as they preached and as he went to the congregations and he met people, they were people who trusted and believed in God. And that is why he says America is good. Not because of our military, not because of our wealth, not because of a number of reasons, our silver and our gold and other things that we have. America is good because America and those that have trusted Jesus have experienced the righteousness of God. If we ever seek to be a righteous nation, God's hand will be removed from this country. And if God's blessings are removed, we're going to be in trouble. And that's why it's important that we celebrate today by thinking this is where we were back then. And now looking at where we are today, we are so far away from those biblical principles that this country was established uh, to do and have done over all these years. And now all of that is being thrown out the door. We are adopting things, believing things, and resisting and not remembering what has made America the greatest nation on earth. Now, America is not perfect. We've made a lot of mistakes. But in the past, we have been able to face those issues and to make the changes that we needed to make. And I believe that God was a part of all of that as well. So the goodness of America is found in the righteousness of God's people. And then second, uh, I believe America is great because of our faith, the faith that we have in God. President Ronald Reagan said this, we shall be as a city upon a hill. And then he added, we believe in one God, the creator and the sustainer of all things, infinite, eternal, unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, love, justice, goodness, and truth, eternally existing in three co-equal persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to go on a journey with me in the history of picking out some things here that certainly Reagan was making note of. The blessings of God, God has always been with us and blessed us because we were a righteous people. We weren't perfect, but we had in our hearts a belief that God is the one that established this great country. And as those who were here, they were to follow him and seek to honor him in their lives. God enabled us to succeed through many troubles, such as the Civil War, World War I, World War II, the Vietnam War, uh, and other involvement of war, the Vietnam War, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, and 9-11. All of those were terrible events in our country, but by the faith of God's people and trusting him through all of that, we were able to become a stronger nation and stronger people because we trusted God and God blessed us and he got us through that. And then we find that uh, another reason why a country has been blessed by God is because of the freedom that we enjoy because of the sacrifice that so many men and women have made for this country. Fighting for freedom. I'm sure you've heard the phrase, freedom is not free. No, it's not free. It has cost a lot of people their lives. And we honor them today because they have done that. And some of those that sacrificed their life were those that simply wrote their name on a piece of paper, on a, a piece of paper those that signed the Declaration of Independence. These were wealthy people. They had everything to lose, very little to gain by doing that because they knew if their signature was on that uh, paper that uh, they uh, would be charged for uh, a treason and they would die. 
Many of them did die. Many of them lost all of their wealth because they believed in something that was so precious and important, a country where freedom would reign. Now, these are just a few, and there's many more reasons why God has blessed our, our country, but I want us to think about the fact that God has been with us in so many wonderful and significant ways. And it just appears today that people just, um, they don't think about that like they used to. And we're getting further and further away from the reality that where we are is because of a loving, kind, gracious Heavenly Father that we have and that we serve. Folks, I'm, I'm saying this. Christians need to awaken from their slumber. We need to come alive and be the people that God has called us to be. The enemy is doing everything that he can to destroy and to weaken this country because God's people have become weakened and stagnated and are asleep. Just like when God called Jonah, what did he do? Got on the boat, went the opposite direction, fell asleep. And a country was dying, but he slept. And that's what's happening, I think, in the lives of God's people. Good people, people that are saved, but they're just kind of hanging out there. And they're not making a difference in their life and how they live and the lives that they are touching. We become so involved with ourselves that we don't have time for God or for his church. We're busy with other things. Well, I want to encourage you today. There's nothing more important than our relationship with Christ and the fact that God saves us to serve and to make a difference. How will people know if we don't let them know about Jesus? 50% of the American people, I read this this morning, 50% of the American people have never been to church a day in their life. Now, that's hard to believe. But one of the most extensive surveys ever taken and just very recent came up with that figure. 50% of Americans have never darkened the door of a church. That number's growing since the pandemic. Uh, less people come to church today than they came before the pandemic. And what does that say? Well, I think it says that we don't really put as a priority our faith and our trust in Christ. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all these things to be added unto you. In other words, put him first in your life. And if he's first, it will determine what you do every day. And for example, when you get up in the morning, what do you do? Well, you ought to pray. You ought to ask God's blessing upon your life. You ought to ask for wisdom and direction and leadership of His Holy Spirit as God sends you out into the world to make America a better place because you're living your faith and you're sharing your faith. So here's the question. Is America, is America a Christian nation? I heard a president of the United States stand up some years ago and say, Unapolog unapologetically, America is not a Christian nation. I disagree with that. Amen. We began as a Christian nation. Now, we may not be as close to God as we ought to be, but we started out as a Christian nation. Not a perfect nation, not perfect people, but people that wrapped their hearts and their life around God and they trusted Him. And folks, we can become a Christian nation if we will do what we need to do. Now, here's what bothers me. There are historians that we rely on in reading uh, their reports on, on uh, history. And many of them who write the very textbooks that are taught in public schools, they've gone and rewritten history. They do not talk about God at all. It is as though that wasn't a factor whatsoever. God in faith is not a part of the history that many of our children are reading. They, they totally delete, I think, two of the most important things. And so here's a subtle example. It's not, you know, something that you would just knock you down. But in the early pilgrims and the Indians met together. Uh, let me I'll go back. This is what historians are saying today. 
Early pilgrims and Indians met together to express their thanks to each other, when actually they met together to give God thanks for the blessings that he had given to them. Subtle. You might even miss that. That sounds pretty good. The pilgrims and the Indians met together to express their, their thanks to each other. Verses that the Indians and the pilgrims met together to express their thanks to God. Totally rewriting out the vital part of what has made America great and will always make America great. You know, in politics they say, if you, if you say something enough times, people will believe it. And that's true. If you say something, enough times people will believe it. And so we are inundated on the news of things that the uh, a administration wants to get out. And they keep saying it, and they keep saying it. And pretty soon people say, well, yeah, this, uh, you know, that's fact. And no, it's not fact. Abraham Lincoln met with a farmer one day. And he said to the farmer, or he asked the farmer, how many legs does a cow have? The farmer said, well, a cow has four legs. Lincoln said, well, what if you counted the tail of the cow as a leg? How many legs would a cow have? And the man said, five. And Lincoln said, no, you can count the tail. You, you can't count the tail as a leg. Cows only have four legs. And the point of that story is that people keep saying things doesn't necessarily make it true. And we need to be discerning enough because of our study of the Word of God and our fellowship of God, reading His Word and praying and making ourselves available to come and to worship and to praise God. Though lies are expressed, we should be able to read uh, through those. So let's look at some things that, that I think have made this country a great, that uh, really expresses that we were a Christian nation. When George Washington, the first president of the United States, was inaugurated. The first thing that he did was to take that Bible that he had used to put his hand upon, and he kissed the Bible. And he invited everyone over to the congressional building where there was a two-hour worship service. Well, that says something about George Washington and the faith of this country. They did not mind honoring and talking about God and bringing those things up. In 1776, now think about this, in 1776, there were 13 uh, um, uh, colonies. 11 of those colonies required that if you ran for a political office, you had to be a professing Christian. Think about that. Does that say something about where they came from and what they thought was uh, important. And then the Congress of the United States voted to spend $300,000 to distribute Bibles in public schools as a part of their curriculum. Now we hear things like that, we say, well, you can't do that. Well, why, why can't you do that? Uh, the Bible is something that now is unread and unsupported by a lot of people. But in those days, uh, people read the Bible. In those days, people believed in God and they trusted Him. So we have been a great nation and we have been a nation that has trusted and talked about God and made God a vital part of our lives. But we're not as much today. We are asleep. We need to awaken from that slumber. We need to be busy about being the the people that God has called us to be. And then, what do you think is going to turn America back to where we should be? I just said that we have something to do as a father of Christ to make this country a better place, a place where God is honored and glorified and recognized and identified. Number one is this. Bring back prayer to our schools. Now, I know uh, what the Supreme Court uh, has said, and it's been so misinterpreted by a lot of places. Uh, how, can we ask God to bless, how, how can we ask God to bless America if we expel God from our, uh, from our schools? When I went to school, 
there are three disciplines that were exercised every day. Number one, we read from the, well, first of all, we pledged allegiance to the American flag, which is not done in a lot of schools now. They will not do that. I thought this was America, but anyway. They don't pledge allegiance to the American flag, uh, and then we would read scripture, we would uh, pray uh, by reciting the Lord's Prayer, uh, and then we would read from the Bible. Those, those four things. Pledge allegiance to the American flag, recite the Lord's Prayer, and read from God's Word. That was something that was done every day. When John F. Kennedy was assassinated, I was the chaplain of the school, of Inglewood High School, and the principal called me to the office and said, would you go on the intercom system and would you read some scripture from the Bible and pray? Now, I did that every Wednesday morning. Every Wednesday morning, the chaplain of the student council would read over the intercom system uh, a scripture and pray. And every student heard that, so I did. I went there and I, I read from Ecclesiastes chapter three, which was President Kennedy's favorite a passage in the Bible, and I prayed. You see, today, we couldn't do that. That uh, is not uh, allowed. And yet, uh, it's so important that children know about God, about His love, and about His grace and mercy. I want to tell you today, public schools are failing academically, uh, in fact, the U.S. ranks near the bottom in math and in writing skills compared to 30 other industrial countries. Think about that. We spend more money per capita on education than any other country, and the product that we are producing is, is inferior to what it ought to be. Uh, we have students now who do not respect teachers or authority or even their own parents who indulge in sexual promiscuity, drugs, and crime. It appears that the school system is today, and right now, is more interested in teaching about gender identity and sexual orientation than they are about reading and writing and arithmetic. And we wonder why America is so far down, down in terms of education and professional um, uh, folks going to a college because with all the money that's spent, it's not achieving what it's supposed to do. And so we need to bring not only prayer and Bible study back uh, to our, our schools, uh, because as we do that, I think that would make a difference. A second thing I would say is that we need to elect, when possible, godly people to serve us. Now I say that, and I put that in there, that uh, when possible, because uh, Christians don't always run for a public office, but they ought to. They ought to be running, godly people. How can we ask God to bless us as, if we elect people who are ungodly? Ungodly people will lead us in ungodly uh, directions. Uh, when Abraham Lincoln was president, and you know he, he won two terms, but he only served as president for 49 months because he was assassinated. But in that short period of time, uh, he issued nine formal calls to America to pray and to fast. Do you think that's, that was important? America needs to pray and we need uh, to fast. We want God to bless us, but we don't even pray and ask his blessings. Lincoln's famous words about prayer was this, I have been driven many times upon my knees by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. Don't we all get in those positions sometimes? I have nowhere else to go but to God. But that, that shouldn't be the last resort. We ought to be fervently praying. The Bible teaches that we're to pray. And... We have not because we ask not. Are we asking for God to put godly people in positions of leadership in our city, our state, our nation? Are we praying for the blessings of God upon this great country? 
Only God can turn this country around. And then lastly, we need to support the nuclear family. Now, the nuclear family is means, and I'm, I'm not sure why that word nuclear is there, but this is what it means. It means a father and a mother who are presiding over their family in one dwelling. Now, many homes are not like that. There's not a mother or there's not a father or the, or the kids are maybe scattered around to relatives. A home without a mother is usually, or rather a home that is a nuclear family of a father and a mother is financially more stable and uh, they are able to be more consistent in raising their uh, children. So we ought to support families. As a church, we ought to do what we can to, uh, to support families, to help them and provide programs and ministries that will help them to be a good parent, a good mother, a good father. Uh, because America is only strong as the family is strong. If you have a nation that have families that are not strong, then it will dissipate the strength and the power of that country. God established the home. It's important for us to encourage people. So will America ever be again one nation that's under God? Uh, I think it can. And you and I can help that to be accomplished as believers in Christ. Because blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We can all do something to make this country great, but I think it begins right here in our own heart, that we are right with God and that we're seeking to honor and to glorify Him and that we can be an encouragement to others about Jesus for them to know and to experience God in their personal life. I've shared with you, I've been uh, uh, speaking to a man that's dying of cancer and he's just taking a turn for, for the worse. I went over there one Sunday afternoon and. And uh, he was back in the back, and uh, his um, son-in-law said, oh, the, the uh, father's here. Well, right there he told me he didn't know a lot about Baptist Church anyway. And I thought, you know, if you want to confess anything to me, I'd be glad to listen. But, uh, but uh, I've tried to minister not just to him, but to that family who are, you know, they're involved in a lot of things, but they're certainly not involved in church. But here's an opportunity to be a witness during a very tragic time uh, as this man will soon depart from this world. He's told me that he, he accepted Christ many years ago. He's not lived for Christ. And he'll tell you that. But now facing death, he realizes the importance of having a personal, vibrant relationship with the living God. I'm very grateful I can minister in that particular area. And, but my point here is that all of us can touch people's lives, to love them, to encourage them, to help them when we can help, and always let them know that there's a God who embraces them, who loves them. No matter how far we get away from God as a country or individually, God's always ready and willing to receive us and to forgive us when we come to him and we ask forgiveness. And as we are forgiven and as we are committed and as we begin to follow the Lord as God has called us to do, that will help not only your life, it will help your church and it will help the United States of America. Bow your head with me.